All right, well, I thought we'll make a start. Um, I know everyone's time's valuable, so I won't take up any more of your time. Um, just wanted to check, Rachel and Renee, you can hear me? Awesome. All right, so tonight we're gonna to be talking about um, a topic keeping you running. Um, basically, we've been seeing a lot of people uh, coming into the clinic who uh, are maybe new to running, who haven't run before. Uh, and obviously it's got a lot to do with the fact that we've got limited options at the moment. Gyms are closed, sports are, have been canceled. So running's really been something that a lot of people have taken up recently. And I think it's got a lot to do with the fact that it's easy. You can pull on a pair of shoes, run out the door and get a really good workout. And it's definitely true. But what we're finding a lot of at the moment is that people are getting injured. So a lot of we're seeing a lot more people, particularly um, since COVID, a lot of people who are coming in in the very, very early stages of running, maybe only two, three, three weeks into running and actually developing issues such as stress fractures, Achilles issues, plantar fasciitis, um, and those shin splints as well. And those sorts of issues that really we tend to see in more higher volumes of running. So really we've, we thought, look, this is a really good opportunity to go through and I guess explain some of the fundamentals that you need to be aware of uh, if you are running. And we look, we hope all of you continue running once um, the gyms and things open, because it really is a fantastic uh, activity. Um, but we thought it'd be a really good opportunity to go through uh, how to structure your running program. So some really simple strategies on how to structure your running program to make sure that you, it works, you get results and you stay injury free. Some really simple things that you can go through uh, to improve your running technique, because we know that is and can be really important. And the other one is what you put on your feet. Um, so we're really, really fortunate to have uh, Renee from the running company, who's gonna go through, and we're gonna chat a little bit about some of the latest trends in shoes. Uh, and she's going to talk about, I know a lot of you have interested, we've got a lot of interest in the new um, Nike uh, Alpha Fly, Vapor Fly range, the carbon shoes, that the sort of record breaking shoe. So we're going to go and touch on that a little bit. So who are we? Um, we're Andrew and Rachel from Melbourne Podiatry Clinic. Um, we're a podiatry clinic that does specialise more in uh, running injuries or at least foot and ankle injuries, pathologies. So it doesn't have to be from running, but we do see a lot of people who do run simply because of the fact that that's the part of the body that hits the ground first. Um, we've got two clinics, one in Essendon and one in Blackburn. Um, I'm Andrew and Rachel's the other podiatrist. I uh, love running. I've done uh, managed to complete a few marathons over the journey and a couple of Ironmans. Um, Rachel has done a lot of running herself as well as um, playing a high level of uh, Aussie rules footy. And the patients that we love to work with and we do um, get a lot of enjoyment working with is runners of all levels from elite runners to those like a lot of people at the moment who are just starting out. And to be honest, the runners that um, who are just starting out, we really love working with because there's a lot of things that we can um, help people with and give them some tips to keep them running. And we love running and we help, I love helping people achieve their running goals. So I've got our email addresses there. Um, we'll, I'll give you them at the end. Um, please, if there's any further questions following tonight, you can contact either of us through this. So tonight, we're going to go through training load, how to get it right. Um, a lot of us get that wrong, and that's generally one of the main reasons why a lot of us get injured. Running assessment and technique. So what we look for when we're looking at a running assessment and some of the things that you can change. And footwear. So what we put on our feet, um, again, really, really uh, essential uh, part of running. So prizes, um, we're very lucky that Renee from the running company has very kindly donated a $200 voucher towards a pair of running shoes. Um, so we'll explain in a minute how you can win that. We'll also have a, a lucky participant who had the opportunity to have a full running gait assessment so we can actually go through that more in person. And we've got pairs of Steigen socks, really awesome anti-blister socks um, that we 
love uh, putting on people's feet to give away um, for, as some prizes as well. So to win, to get in um, a chance to win the either the uh, running voucher or the running assessment, we're going to be just posting letters throughout the presentation. Um, when we get to the last letter, the first person or the first few people to put the uh, word in uh, the, the, the letter spell um, into the chat box uh, will win the prize. So make sure we'll, you, you won't miss them as they come along. So there you go. The first letter is, I'll go back to that, is S. So the other thing is for all participants of tonight's presentation, we are offering um, a new patient offer. So it's an exclusive offer for all um, participants of this webinar. We're offering a, a no gap uh, assessment for anyone who's got private health insurance or just a $59 assessment. We basically will go through a full comprehensive assessment with you to find out what your injury is or any concerns you're having with your running. Have a look at why it's occurring. Um, so chat about your training program, have a bit of a look at your running assessment. We'll discuss some ways to fix it and look at ways that we can obviously prevent it from coming back. So if you do uh, are keen to take that offer up, all you have to do is just email either of us um, and I'll leave the details at the end and um, you can organise a time and we can uh, go through that with you. So can we just have a quick question? Um, can you just quickly pop in to the chat box? I know there's a Q&A box, but just use the chat box to make it nice and easy. Tell us your name, whether you have any injury concerns or what injuries you may currently have. The type of running, shoe, it only has to be one word answers, the type of running you do either road or trail and the shoe that you run in. Great, so we've got some, uh, we've got a Nimbus, we've got Mizuno's, calf strain. Yeah, that's a pretty common one. Saw calves, road running. Got a few ASICs, GT2000s, Nimbus, 1080s, New Balance, good, bit of shin splints. Oh, Achilles issue, yep, yeah. calf tendonitis, sure. Yep, yeah. a lot of typical running injuries that we tend to see. There you go, calf issues. Calf issues tends to be a very common one. Yeah, yeah, no, there's, there's a wide variety of issues. Yeah, Nike Pegasus. Neuroma, yeah, that's a, that's a, a tough one to treat, but we do see a few of those. Okay, excellent. Brooks, Brooks Adrenaline, yep. Yeah. It's been a good go-to over the years. Excellent. Well, thank you for putting all those in. As you can see, running injuries are very common. Most of us who run have experienced some running injury. And look, it does make sense. There's a lot of load that we have to deal with when we run. And uh, if, if we're overdoing things, um, something tends to become injured. So interestingly, uh, a lot of... You know, it's estimated that over 60% of all running injuries are due to training errors. And that's not an incident during training. That's basically mistakes in your train programming. Um, that can be as simple as just the old classic doing too much too soon, or it can be a little bit more complicated in the way that you're running over a period of time. So the reason why that's um, obviously so important is that you know, one of the things that we often don't think too much about is actually structuring, a, having a basic structure to our running program. And Rachel's going to go through a little bit about that today, because that is something, again, that, you know, if we can structure that properly, we can reduce a huge number of injuries. So I'll pass you over to Rach, and she's going to go through uh, that. So as you can see, the next letter is T. Thanks, Andrew. So I will just chat a little bit about training load. So training load is a really common topic that I talk about with my clients in the clinic. So whether you're an elite athlete or just starting out running, the load is really crucial to um, injury prevention and the longevity of your sporting performance as well. So when I talk about load, there's external load and internal load. External load can include um, things like distance, the surfaces that you run on, um, whether there's like an incline or a decline, and then internal load is more specific to your age, your capacity, 
So whether you've had a previous injury, lifestyle factors and sleep. So it's really quite important that you do get your training load correct because if you get it right, you can run for longer um, and it, you do get less overuse injuries as well. Um, so when I try to describe, describe load management to my clients at the clinic, a really good analogy that I like to use is beer tolerance. So load is very training to um, sort of drinking alcohol or drinking beer. Uh, if you say, if you rock up to a bar and you've never had an alcoholic drink before, you're going to wake up not feeling too great. With a hangover, you're probably going to say to yourself, oh God, I'm never going to do that again. It's very similar with running. If you go out, you haven't run for a really long period of time, smash out, say a 5k run, you're probably going to wake up really sore the next day, have a few aches and pains and not want to do it and just pack it in. So similarly, um, some people might think um, potentially I want to get a bit better at this, I want to be a bit more social and drinking, I might say, hang on, if I practice this, I might be able to last a little bit longer during the night. So a few weekends go by, you build up your tolerance a little bit. In a month's time, say you're drinking for three or four beers, you're having a good time with your mates, you drink, you wake up the next morning and you're feeling pretty fresh. So similarly, very similar to running, you do want to build it up quite gradually. And like I was saying before, if you say you have sober October or you go without running for a month's time, then on November 21st, you go out and smash it, then that's when you're likely to cause, say, an overload injury or have training errors within your running practice. So with your um, load management, it will look quite similar to a seesaw in that we want your training load to increase gradually and then we're going to gradually build up capacity to tolerate that load. And it's just going to be this pattern and it'll go on and on. So gradually build up the training load and then once our capacity is improved and we can tolerate that load, that's when we can increase our load once again. So how do you make sure that you are managing your load? So there is a pretty common rule that's been around for a long time called the 10% rule. And what it means is that we just are gradually increasing our load by 10% um, each week. Unfortunately, this rule is not backed by research. Uh, and essentially, if I give you an example, say you're running 20 kilometers in the first week, um, if you were to follow this rule and gradually increase your load by 10%, you'd be adding two weeks. So the next week you'd be running about 22 kilometers. Um, what I usually recommend to patients is called the acute chronic workload ratio. It is something that, that does have a bit of research behind it. It is a little bit more complex, um, but I found that it works pretty good at really decreasing your injury risk. So essentially, um, what you want to do is calculate your activity by multiplying the minutes by your rate of perceived exertion and you'll get a total for over the four week period and you compare that to your previous load. So I've got an example to run through with you. Um, and then with your calculation at the end, we want to hear what's called the sweet spot, which is a value between 0 0.8 and 1.3. So if we go through the example, Sally is a melatologist and bonus point to anyone who can guess what a melatologist is and a keen runner. She enjoys keeping active every day and strives to go for a long run on the weekend. Last weekend, she ran 12 kilometers. So let's look at Sally's activity over the last week. So on Monday, she had an easy run. She didn't find it too hard. So anyone that isn't sure what the rate of perceived exertion is, it's just a value out of 10 on how, felt, on how hard you felt you exerted yourself within that session. So nice easy run, about a 5 out of 10. So we timed the minutes, so the duration by the rate of perceived exertion to get a total of 150. And that's her score for the session. On Tuesday, a bit more of a longer run. Oh, sorry, a gym session, 60 minutes. 
not too high intense. So a score of three, so 60 times three. So we get a value of 180. Now going through the week on Wednesday, she has a really more high impact training. So going for a run, long duration run with some interval work, rate of perceived exertion of eight, six times eight equals 480. So what you want to do for the week is add up each value um, of activity for the week and then we get a total and your acute load for that week, if we can have a look down the bottom, is 1,350. So Sally's friend asked her to do a charity run for the Wean Bee Foundation in a few weeks' time. She was keen to participate and decided to get some extra training in to make sure she would be able to achieve her run. She decided to add in an extra training session on Saturday. So let's have a look at how this impacted her training load. So if we have a look, she, her week looks pretty normal, um, except she's added in that extra training session on a Saturday. So she's gone for a 60 minute run, training intervals again, so quite high intensity, rate of perceived exertion of eight, receiving a value of 480. So if we take her acute load, so her acute load is the total of, the, of that week, which equals 1,830. So that's with the added value of the new session. And then we take the average of her four previous weeks. So um, going off the basis that she did the same activity for the previous four weeks with a average score of 1,350. So she has a total, um, her acute chronic workload works out to be 1.36, which puts her in the danger zone of doing too much and having too much of an increase in load, putting her at a bit of a risk of getting an injury. So if we just go to the, so we've got letter R, which we can all write down. So a really great, great app that you could use to track your load is Strava. I'm not sure some of you might use it already, um, but if we just have a look at a few examples, so we can see in the first graph, where we've got uh, the athlete is gradually increasing their load. And then at weak load, they do quite a lot more. Um, and we can see that that increase has just caused a bit of an injury. Excuse me, so they've had to backtrack um, too much due to that injury and then gradually climb again. So you can see that when you do climb too much, it can put you at risk of, um, at risk of getting an injury and that can really sort of set back your training and performance. If we have a look at graph number B, um, someone doing more threshold training, they have been able to maintain that training load for quite a few weeks, but we can see towards June, um, that potentially that load has just been too high and then they end up injuring themselves at the end of the, at around June, which can um, cause a bit of a setback again. Graph number three is um, more what you would see with an acute chronic workload ratio, sort of hitting that more sweet spot region. If we start around April, we can see they're gradually climbing, have a little bit of a dip around just before May, and then we can see them gradually climbing again. So going by that rule, although it might take you a little bit longer and you might not seem as if you're working as hard fast, over time, it, you do tend to see the results with your performance and tend not to break down as quickly. So if we look at what the evidence tells us, um, there was a paper published in 2014 by Stovall et al, which showed that elite, elite level athletes running performance was best predicted by the volume of easy runs and then practicing hard interval and tempo runs. So they had a look at um, a lots of similar exercise based activity. So they looked at high intensity training a more threshold training and pyramid style training. And what they actually found with athletes that did more low intensity training and then also high intensity training more often had better outcomes. The positives of polarized trainings 
uh, that we can allow training adaptations to occur. So what I was referring to before with the seesaw effect, gradually increasing your load and allowing your body to change and adapt and also vary your mechanical load. So not stressing the same tissues over and over again. Unfortunately, um, in our culture, I typically see a lot of people doing more threshold activity and there is this perceived notion within uh, the public eye or the fitness industry, industry that we have to work really, really hard to gain results, whereas that's not really the case. Um, this whole no pain, no gain mentality. This sort of mentality can lead to a lot of training strain and physiological cost. It doesn't, we don't have a lot of variation as well during the high, high repetition loads. Um, and we can't do as much volume either under, this, under these training principles. Um, so now I'll pass it back over to Andrew and he's going to talk to you a little bit about running gait analysis. Thanks, Rach. Um, so yes, if everyone writes down the uh, letter I, it's the next letter. Cool, so I'm going to go through a little bit about running gait assessment. Um, I guess why we bother doing it in the first place um, and how I guess it can uh, give us some information that can be really uh, useful um, for us when we're treating um, people, runners in particular. So why do we do an assessment? Um, number one can be to reproduce the symptoms. So if someone's got a running injury that they only get while they run, getting them on a treadmill or getting them out running obviously can be a really good way to say, where does this actually hurt? Um, and then they, we can actually get them to say, right, I'm feeling this along my shin or their heel or whatever. Um, so that's probably the number one. Number two is probably where we do a little bit of detective work. Um, so we're looking for clues at what we might further investigate. So if we have a look at someone running, there might be a few things that we can spot. Uh, and then that gives us an indication of, okay, we might need to go and test that. So if we're seeing someone with really poor glute control, we say, all right, we might need to go and work on uh, assessing how strong that is or have a bit of a look at their single leg squat or if we're seeing that they're running on their forefoot, is there a, an ankle joint impingement that we need to have a bit of a look at? So that's where it can give us some clues. And some of the things that we can look at is strength testing. So are we seeing, you know, weak glutes? Are we seeing weak calves? Any signs of um, weakness anywhere? Having a bit of a look at the running assessment can definitely um, trigger. And that's where we basically go, okay, that's, we can pick that up in a gait analysis. Let's go and investigate that further. So that's often why we use introduce a gait analysis quite early on. Um, flexibility. So obviously having a bit of a look at someone running, there are certainly um, areas that need to be, uh, have certain uh, movements. And if we're seeing some restrictions there, um, that can again lead us to go and maybe look at measuring them. And one of the simple ones we look at a lot is the ankle joint range of motion. It tends to have a big uh, play and relationship with running. So, um, and a lot of some of the injuries that we treat. So that's a, a really simple one that we tend to look at a lot. And asymmetry, are we seeing any differences left versus right side? Is it, are those changes or differences because you're carrying an injury and you're doing some compensation or is this just how you are put together? Um, is there a limb length difference? Is there some you know, weakness on one side that we can further investigate? So it gives us a lot of information on what we can look at and break down a little bit more further. And it's obviously difficult to treat a running injury if we actually can't see what's happening when they're running. So often things, we can do an assessment in the chair, we can have a look at someone standing, doing a few movement patterns, but until we actually have a look at someone running, it's really difficult to ascertain what the, um, the, what's actually occurring and what might be causing that particular injury. Because most of the injuries that we tend to see, particularly in the lower leg, are more commonly what we call overuse type injuries. So they tend to be injuries that have occurred over a longish period of time. And that's why these movement patterns do tend to predict a lot of issues. Uh, and when we're managing them, understanding that's really, really important. So quickly, we're gonna talk a little bit about running technique. Um, in the chat box, who has at some point tried to change the way that they run and what did you try and change? So there's been lots of stuff out there. Um, 
would I'd love to hear just some some feedback on what some of the things that you've been told um, and has it worked? So we've so far got a lot of heel strike to toe strike, yep. Increased cadence, heel recovery, forefoot to midfoot, speed slowing down. Um, tried to run once only on the forefoot after getting shin plane, didn't last, yep. Changed to mid to forefoot strike, which improved ITB, runner's knee, knee drive. Yep, lean forward, stride longer. Yep, all good, all good things. Swing arms, yeah, simple stuff like that. Yeah, so there's a lot of stuff out there and I think uh, not all of it is irrelevant to everyone uh, and some of it is, some of it isn't. So one of the things that we focus on a lot at our clinic is if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I think a lot of the time like we should be running a certain way we should be doing this a certain way. We should be forefoot striking or midfoot striking, or we should be um, leaning forward or all of these sorts of things. A lot of, a lot of our movement patterns to so the way that we move and run is determined by our anatomy. So basically our biomechanics is determined by the shape of our pelvis, the shape of the joints, the way that, you know, bones, some bones have rotated more or less than others. And we know from experience that, doing lots and lots of strength work and training work doesn't actually change a lot of these movement patterns significantly. So really sometimes forcing a body to do something that it's not particularly well designed for um, actually ends up causing more injury. So it's not a one size fits all strategy by any means. And that's why it's really, really important that getting a little bit of understanding of what your issue is and making some changes. And sometimes they're very subtle is really important that we do it sort of within certain ranges and not just say, look, you, you're doing this, you need to fit into this very small little um, scope. So a lot of you may have um, seen this footage, um, but it gives a really good example of where, you know, we're talking at the end of the day about performance and running. Um, just because you have what would be classified as not a particularly good running technique. And you can have a look at uh, Prishka Jeptu's running technique and you can sort of see what I'm talking about. But it's a good example of where, um, uh, just because she doesn't have a classic, normal, perfect running technique, doesn't obviously mean that it can affect her performance. So I'll just quickly play this. She obviously was a silver medalist at the London Olympics in 2012. You can really have a bit of a look at what's going on with her. She's got that really internal, internally rotated um, knees, real tendency of the knee to drop in. Quite a lot of abduction, so that twisting off as well as um, the foot tending to really quite significantly pronate or evert. Um, you know, the questions are always gonna be there. Like, you know, could she have won gold if she had a better running technique? But she's finished silver at, really at the top of her game. So. Um, Yes, there's, there's examples of uh, lots of people out there who don't perhaps have a really classic running technique, but it really hasn't affected their performance. So it goes back to the same thing. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And when we do make changes, we have to be very, very careful that we're not just putting a one size fits all um, model to this. So what can we change? I guess is really important because um, there are lots of things you can change with running. Um, this is sort of an example of some of the things we look at when in a running assessment, but some really, really common running injuries can be treated with simple running technique changes. So I think in the past, a lot of the time we would be, you know, looking at try, trying to force change. And that might be something like an orthotic with a lot of these issues. Now, simple running technique changes can be really, really effective at preventing issues, um, and managing issues and also, also almost offering a, a solution to a lot of these problems, whether it be in the short term or the longer term. So we use running technique changes a lot. Um, and one of the, one of the, I guess one of the ways we can use it is in the short term. So if you've got a, a particular running injury and a really classic one is, is anterior knee pain. So pain at the front of the knee, often called runner's knee because it's very, very common it's often got a lot to do with um, glute control, strength uh, around the knee, uh, as well as your biomechanics. 
So a really simple one is that often it's just the fact that the musculature around the knee at this certain point in time isn't strong enough to be able to control that or even your glutes. Um, simply changing your running technique by reducing the load on the front of the knee can give someone almost instantaneous relief from this. And we, we do find that we can use this as a long-term application. So, you know, we might be wanting to try and change someone's technique for the long term to prevent this issue from um, becoming a real problem. But we can also use it in the short term and it can be as effective as mid run, making some changes to your running technique. When your knee pain comes on, you change a couple of simple things and you can start to see your knee pain settle. So we use it as said a lot in sort of for longer term changes, but it can be really useful as almost a, an immediate thing that you can implement halfway towards the end of a run if your knee pain is starting to come on. So yeah, knee pain, so that anterior knee pain is a common one. ITB friction syndrome, it's a real problem. Uh, shin pain, the things that we tend to focus on with those three issues is about decreasing your stride length. So shortening your stride a little bit. And what that tends to do is it increases your knee flexion, prevents your knee landing in such a extended position. So immediately we just reduce the load on the anterior knee. Um, and it also can change your the foot strike position. So we can reduce that braking force that tends to apply when you're landing with a very straight knee, uh, landing on your heel. We can reduce the, uh, the braking force um, and can immediately take, uh, I guess, reduce the direct load through the anterior knee, the um, ITB as well as the as well as the lower leg and the shin. One of the things that we commonly see is that we can, by shortening your stride or changing your stride length, and again, this is very relative. So for some people, they may already be doing this. So this is maybe not something that would necessarily focus on with everyone. But if we can shorten your stride, often what we do see is that we are able to see improvements with your uh, pelvic control. So by bringing your foot landing a little bit closer to your center of gravity, suddenly we can see that your glutes are in a much more functional, stronger position, and they're actually starting to control things a little bit more. And that may be partly why we're able to reduce that knee from, from dropping in um, when you are running. The other one that we can have a bit of a look at, and you, a lot of you mentioned that you have had Achilles and calf issues, is looking at, again, trying to change stride length and having a bit of a look at reducing the load on the Achilles itself in the lower calf. And one of the ways that we can do that is just by reducing your, the contact time that your foot spends in contact with the ground. Um, and that's a simple way to reduce the load of your Achilles in what we call eccentric loading. And that's what your Achilles tends to do a lot of when you're running. So as you're running, you tend to land, stabilize through to mid stance and then go to toe off through that phase, your Achilles is undergoing a lot of force. So if you do have an Achilles issue, part of the way to keep you running, and this again, may be only something we do while we're addressing the injury, is just maybe to reduce your contact time um, to allow to just a slight reduction through your Achilles while we build it up, get it stronger, and then enable you to continue running. And our focus is always as much as we possibly can with most of the injuries that we're seeing, is if we can to keep people running. Um, it's, it, Often having extended periods off running can actually be more detrimental, particularly if your goal is obviously to continue to run. So what does a running assessment involve? Obviously there, there are a few ways that we can do it. We can do it on a treadmill. This is a photo of our setup at our clinic. We can do it on a treadmill. Treadmill is great because it's easy. You can have a look at someone and jump on it straight away, or you can do it outside. And obviously with COVID, We've got limitations on people moving around, um, people still running. They still need us to have a bit of a look at what's going on with your running technique. So we've been getting a lot of people to either film themselves or get someone to film them running outside. Um, either we generally ask for a sort of a, a frontal view and a side on view. So you can literally just have a camera run towards the camera and have it side on. We've got the option to obviously be able to have a look at that. We can put it into our software, slow it down. Um, and have a bit of a look and then just run a telehealth consult and go through some of the key things. We've got great programs to sort of send drills and give um, recommendations on that. So um, that's uh, one of the simple ways. Clearly, obviously, you know, most people are running outside. A lot of people are. Um, so 
the good news is that even if we do have a look at someone running on a treadmill, there isn't significant differences. Um, and we can still get a really good understanding of what's going on. So we video it. Main reason why we video it is just simply to be able to slow it down. A lot of the things that we're looking at, we can't pick up under the naked eye. So just to be able to slow it down and replay it and review it over and over um, is really, really useful. Um, compare. So if we made an intervention, whether it be a strength program, whether it be a gait change, any of these things we can compare pre and post. Um, running cues. So these are some of the running cues that we tend to uh, discuss. Cadence. I don't know a few of you mentioned that. Cadence is a really simple way. It's what we call an external cue. So it's one that you can follow yourself with good reliability. This example here, you just download a metronome. And if we work out that maybe 175 or 170 or 180 might be your optimal running cadence to get the desired changes that we're after, literally go and practice it, go for a run with a metronome on. And there's some great apps like Spotify that actually have music to a certain beats per minute as well. And you can play that over the the metronome as well, which can work really well. Knee lift. So again, if we're trying to look at sometimes shortening your stride, increasing your knee lift, a lot of people as they start to fatigue, that's the first thing that tends to tend to go. And therefore your stride length starts to um, increase. And arms, a simple one that a lot of people um, don't really focus on is keeping them pumping like on train tracks. A lot of people, as they start to fatigue, tend to rotate and guess what happens? You're rotating your trunk and you're bringing your hips around with you. So simply keeping that as a bit of a focus, relaxing your shoulders, keeping them nice and parallel can make a big difference in terms of uh, your running biomechanics. So we're just playing around at the moment, but um, we're really, really excited about the prospect of what the future is going to bring in terms of uh, running assessment and running technology. Um, we've got this great um, program that we're using at the moment called RunScribe that ha has sensors that we can, wearable sensors that we can place on the running shoes. And it gives us huge amounts of data um, of what's going on with your running mechanics, um, your, your step rate. And you can see here, you can, you can, we can have a look at your step rate, your stride length, your contact time, your flight ratio, um, have a look at some of the shock metrics we can look at here on the left, you can see we can work out what um, your forefoot or your foot strikes doing, things like your pronation velocity and all of these sorts of things, we can get a lot of information. So, you know, the beauty of this is that we can do it in clinic, but we can also, um, the plan is to be able to loan this out to people um, to actually go and get some real world data and see what's actually going on. And again, it can give us some really good stuff that we can, can't really pick up with the naked eye or even under a gait analysis to say, okay, this might be explaining why this issue is happening. Um, so if anyone's keen um, to, who are interested in this, we are um, sort of running a few little sort of pilot studies with it. So um, if that's something you were interested in, get in touch with myself at the, uh, in the next um, coming days and I can certainly chat to you a little bit more about it. But it's certainly, I think, where the future is going to go um, and it's going to give us some just uh, you know, a huge amount of information that we can use going forward. All right, so the next letter is D. Make sure you write that down. And we're now gonna have a bit of a chat to Renee. Um, Renee uh, runs the running company in Yarraville. Um, and I thought one of the things that's come up recently that I thought we might just start with is um, a lot of us can't get running shoes at the moment. Running shoe stores, unfortunately, are closed and probably for the next week as well. Um, I just thought I'd quickly get, if you want to just talk quickly about your virtual fit that you're offering at the moment, Renee, for, for people who are currently in the need of look on the, on the lookout for a new pair of running shoes. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we're actually, I think at this stage, we're going to be closed for until the end of October, actually. So it's quite a few weeks away. But um, so I, I suppose how we've sort of gone with this, it's, it's very important. And, and our process is something that, um, you know, everyone really enjoys. And, and we have that ability to be able to have people 
people there in store and get them on a treadmill and have you running in shoes and have a look at your gait and have all these conversations around the different types of shoes and how they're going to work best for you. Um, but I suppose how we've sort of managed that at the moment is still um, allowing people to um, have those conversations with us via email and phone call, um, sending out a, um, a piece of like just some um, a document that's got quite a lot of questions that we would generally be asking here a lot if we were in store together. Um, so, you know, getting all that information is um, like uh, the biggest part of the, the fitting in a sense. Um, there's obviously a few things that we can't do, like doing the gait analysis itself, um, but we are sort of managing and, and sort of able to get people to sort of once we get all that information that we need and have those discussions, um, able to get them down to the store if they're in, within the area um, so that we can, you know, try the two options that we've sort of narrowed things down, check the fit and the feel of the shoe. Um, and then from there, yeah, that's how we sort of uh, are moving forward for now um, until we can um, have people back in store and on the treadmill and those things as well. But um, like I sort of said to Andrew and, and Rachel as well, like, um, you know, as much as it's hard to get by with not being what doing or, or doing what we normally do with customers in store. I think that those conversations and um, bouncing off each other and asking the right questions and, and what you're needing in a shoe, it, it, it's still a big part of the process and it's still something that we can do and guide people into the shoe choices that they need. So we're still here. Yeah. Awesome. Glad to hear it. Yeah. Said we've got a lot of, a lot of people at the moment that are <laughs> having a bit of a look at their running shoes and or coming in. And I think, well, the first thing you need to be changing is your, is your running shoes so it's really yeah. great that you're offering that yeah um i thought i thought we could just quickly start on what are some of the, the latest trends in running shoes so what where are shoes sort of out at the moment and where do you think they're sort of heading what direction they're heading yeah, well, I suppose um, there, there's quite a few little running trends at the moment. So we've got all our racing shoes. So you've got your carbon fibre plate and your racing shoes. So that's a that's a big trend at the moment. Um, but I suppose like to talk about and get away from that for the moment and talked about the trends in just your, you know, your more traditional models of shoes. Um, I find that, you know, um, a lot of shoes are trending in that sort of maximal way in terms of that rocker type midsole. Um, we're getting a lot of, well, all the brands are started to follow um, that type of midsole where we're getting a bit more rigidity in through the forefoot. So that just provides that propulsion and that sort of feel um, when we're sort of in the shoe and sort of transitioning from heel to toe. Um, so those types of shoes are definitely sort of um, stepping up and I suppose that they're, without having that brand bias that now we're getting a lot of the brands that are involved in those types of shoes and producing those shoes as well. Um, the high energy sort of return light foams um, that they're all sort of dabbling in that way and providing different cushioning um, and, and a sort of feel underneath the foot, um, less overlays, light shoes, um, sort of more that in terms of that natural motion in a sense but shoes that feel a bit more effortless around your foot so you're getting less overlays and knit uppers that sort of really hug and have a nice contour and shape around them as well um so in in terms and to sort of carry that on a little bit you know we're sort of used to back in the day those really heavily rigid shoes um a lot of features in them more shoe is and more support was always better i feel like we're moving away from that in a way so we're doing a bit of a circle and going back and sort of realizing that you know we don't need those really rigid high density foams um to control the foot in a way and that shoes that feel a little bit more natural around the foot are actually sort of stepping up a little bit so that's yeah i suppose in terms of you know where i see shoes going that's how i would sort of say that we're trending in a way um, and, um, yeah. Yeah. I'm amazed actually how some of those maximal shoes are as light as they are. Oh, um, unbelievable. Like, so, yeah. you know, that, that, that's the, you look at them and think this is going to weigh a ton and they're, they're lighter than the, the, just, you know, they're much more lower profile, yeah. profile shoes. Yeah. So. You've got yeah. more shoe fit look, but it actually ends up feeling a lot lighter on the on the end of your foot. Yeah, the amount of people that pick up a shoe and that you can see the stack height of the shoe and all the cushioning, they're like, oh, that's going to be really heavy, and you put on your foot, super light. But those, and and I mean, I think that's um, in a way, you know, and I say to a lot of people when they come in, you know, 
so many people used to have shoes that would last for years <laughs> and go, oh, I've had my shoe for two years and it still looks fine. I suppose, you know, we're compromising on, on shoes lasting for a long time, but I think it's a smart thing too. Like shoes shouldn't be lasting that long. We should be changing them. The foams are generally lighter or flexible, softer underfoot, um, but they're still providing that energy return and less impact into the bottle body for the right amount of time, if that makes sense. So they're not lasting for two years and not feeling heavy and clunky under the foot and super stable but they are definitely providing what we need um and, and you know um just meaning that we need to change them over a little bit sooner <laughs> how often do you like for, for a sort of typical mileage shoe how how long do you normally recommend that people hang on to their shoe floor whether it be kilometers or time I normally say around 600. That's my blanket rule. Some people are less, some people get a little bit more. So I say if you're around that 600 mark, um, out, like, I mean, if you listen to your body, you can generally start to find that you'll feel um, quite fatigued and your muscles won't pull up as well. You might be completely fine and then you just notice you're really tight in your calves when you're finishing your long runs. It's generally probably because your shoes are nearly ready to be replaced. Um, but yeah, I reckon that blanket rule around that 600 Ks is where I'd be sort of looking at changing um yeah changing shoes over especially for your higher mileage and your everyday runner yeah yeah so another thing that's sort of been booming over the last couple of years is trail running um yeah. i thought i'd be interested to just hear what are the main differences between road and trail shoes so I suppose um, in terms of your, your road shoes um, versus trail, I mean, some people can definitely get away with using some of the more robust road models that um, on sort of gentle trails and they might dabble a little bit when they first start running and go out and do a little bit of trail running, but majority of it road. So I definitely think that there are some models that are going to accommodate that in a way. Um, but what I do find is that, you know, when we are doing that trail running, the benefits of having the features that the trail shoes um, provide um, it, it's you know second to none when we sort of compare that when we go back to our road shoe to do it in a sense so um, the features that will vary in terms of um, the, the shoes themselves is you're going to have um, a lot more of a robust sort of upper that's going to sort of hold the foot and keep it nice and secure on the shoe as well so you know how I sort of spoke a little bit before about moving away from all these overlays and a lot of structure around the foot so um, those uppers aren't going to be great when you're on a trail you want to feel nimble and light and be able to I suppose adjust your foot um, to the different sort of trains that you're on and have that proprioception so um, having something that you're going to be slipping around in the shore it's not going to feel really secure around the foot is not going to be ideal so you have those more robust sort of uppers um, you're going to find that you're going to have features like um, uh, I suppose the lugs on the shoes. Um, so they're going to vary in terms of the terrain that you're on. So, and that's where we'll have those discussions with people. So what type of trail shoes um, are you using uh, or what trails are you going on to? So, you know, if they're, they're really muddy, wet trails, you're going to want deeper lugs um, versus something that's going to be a bit more hybridy, not as deep. Um, they have things like rock plates. So you're not getting anything coming up in underneath foot. Um, you know, they're generally the stack heights, even though we are going into those more maximal shoes, a lot of them, you're a bit closer to the ground. So you want to have that, um, I suppose you want to have a bit more of that ground contact. So you know where you are and you're footing in those types of things versus your road shoes. Yeah. And I guess lastly, um, there's obviously been a lot of hype around the, uh, uh, carbon footplate shoes yeah. with the, with the breaking of the two hour record in them and things. Yeah. Um, they're obviously now very much available to the general public. Um, yeah. How do you normally recommend those to people and what, what, when would someone wear one of these shoes? Um, so I suppose the recommendation um, in terms of those types of shoes, they're going to be for people that uh, are wanting a performance shoe. So um, they may be coming in um, and, and they've got their mileage shoe. They've got their shoe that they do a lot of their training in and they're wanting something that they're going to race in um, and then pull out for a few of those sessions as well. So in terms of um, the, like, I mean, we're so spoiled for choice at the moment in terms of those racing shoes and there is a lot of hype about it. But I suppose it's about figuring out um, what 
you need in terms of um, what you're actually training for, what types of sessions you're going to be doing in these types of shoes and just sort of more educating each person on, um, you know, what we're using those shoes for. So, you know, the carbon fibre shoes, what they're providing is, you know, if you look at someone that's doing like track work and they're in like you look at them they're in spikes and they have that plating through the front to get them up on their toes and they feel fast and they're running around and they're using them for very short reps around a track um, so now we're getting these shoes that people can get out there and run marathons in that have these carbon fiber plates that provide that sort of rigid forefoot with that propulsive sort of feel so they're getting that cadence up and really utilizing getting on the forefoot of their sh their foot um, and, and still providing all that cushioning so they're still in a safe shoe so I think that you know when we're um like sort of educating people in terms of that we're just making sure that they are aware that they are a performance shoe not an everyday shoe um and and sort of recommending, you know, the different models for, for what they're going to be using it for. So, um, you know, are they going to be out there training and doing long interval sessions and running marathons and what sort of paces are they going to be running them at? Or are they going to be hitting the track and doing 400s, 800s? They want a sort of racing flat for that. So, and I think that where we're at at the moment in terms of, you know, um, Nike and New Balance and, and even ASICS um, and Ciccone, like what they've sort of um, provided in terms of those racing shoes, they're all going to really um, compete with each other, but also really differ and have a different feel for each of those um, events and, and sort of distances as well. Awesome. Thank you very much for that. That was great. Um, so uh, that's nearly comes to the end of our session. We're going to ask um, if anyone's got any questions. Um, so please, if you do have any questions, just pop them into the chat box and we might, we might spend the next um, five minutes uh, answering some questions. So, anything um we've got the last so and also if anyone's got their top takeaway um uh, from this evening please pop that in um because we'd love to know what you sort of most uh i guess took away from the from this evening and what you're hopefully gonna uh try and implement uh, on your next run so this is the last letter so first one if you want to write that in Excellent. All right, good. We'll be in touch with uh, the winners of those prizes. So yes, if anyone's got any questions. So let's have a look. This is for Rachel, actually. So if you want to pop your uh, mic on, Rach. Um, what was the recommended range for the acute chronic workload ratio? So it was 0 0.8 to 1.3. So you'll just need to note that if you deload yourself too much, you can also put yourself at risk of injury. So by going below 0 0.8 um, and then alternatively overloading yourself, which is 1.3. Oh. There are some really great, oh, I'll just um, touch on that. There are some really great resources online. So there are some free Excel spreadsheets available that people have actually designed and you can download them and just pop in your sort of your daily um, activity levels and they'll actually calculate what your acute chronic workload ratio is. Excellent. Uh, we've got another question here. Um, how important is it to rotate shoes, have multiple pairs? Um, it can help for sure. It depends probably how much running you're doing and the types of running that you're doing. Um, so, uh, there obviously are different shoes designed for different types of running you're doing. So we obviously have the more high mileage shoes um, for people who are doing more longer, slower, more endurance based running. And then we've got lower profile um, tempo, so racing flat style shoes that you can do. It can be also as simple as having a multiple pairs that you can just rotate through. And we often do find that that can extend uh, a little bit of the wear of the shoe, so it can make the shoes last a bit longer. Um, as, as ridiculous as it is, um, often running in the same pair of shoes, particularly if you're doing a lot of running, um, so I say every day, it can mean that the shoe does tend to um, wear out a little bit quicker. So one of the things to combat that is that you can just rotate the shoes, but it's probably also horses for courses too, making sure that the shoe that you've got is appropriate for the type of running um, that you've got doing. Um, well, this is a question I can ask Renee actually. Um, how many kilometers do you recommend the, the Nike carbon runners usually last for? 
I would say around 300. 300. There you go. So it's a lot less than a normal mileage. Yeah, a lot less, yeah. I, I, do, I think that, you know, it, it is always, I always say it is going to be dependent on each person. Um, and, but I would say that that sort of shoe, I, I would be thinking around that 300k mark is going to be an ideal time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. I've um, got a question from Phil saying, do people have the same technique running on the road versus treadmill? Um, no, not 100% the same. Um, but there's been a lot of studies that show that it's um, reasonably similar. So it's, it's not completely, this, it's not absolutely the same, but it does, there's a, most of the things that when we're looking at a running assessment, we can have the same, have a look at the same and see the same things that we'd be seeing out on the road. So I want to emphasize that the, the running assessment gives us some, some information. It's not the be all and end all, um, you know, you running fresh is going to look very different to you running at the end of a run. But what it does do, as I said, is it can help show some clues that we can then look at and investigate further. And it can give us a little bit of an opportunity to have a look at a bit of a before and after as well. Um, I've got a question for Rach. Uh, when does the 10% rule go wrong and how do you recommend using it? Yeah, so the 10% rule, it's not so much that it goes wrong. I think it's more that um, the performance, there, there are better alternatives out there. Um, and it, uh, I will backtrack actually. It, it can go run when you're working with sort of a lot more, um, when you're working with higher mileage because the 10% the is going to be a lot more. Um, and then it's not necessarily relative for that, but a lot more of the research um, more leans towards it not being a good outcome for performance. So if you're wanting to, say, reach a certain goal within a certain time frame, or whether you're wanting to get quicker, faster, it's not really the right uh, way to go in terms of load management. Would you have anything to add with that? Andrew? No, I think that's that's probably spot on. Yeah, so say the ten percent was probably been sort of pulled out out uh, as a bit of a rough guide. I think it's a good basic measure, but we've just shown show that the acute chronic workload ratio just gives us a little bit more information. It's a bit more reliable as a predictor of um, managing your managing your load. Someone's just asked, how do I look at organising assessment? Well, I'll, uh, the next page here um, has our, our details. So. If you're interested, as I said, in a running gauge assessment, um, to have a bit of a look at your running, we'll chat to you a little bit about your running program, or as I said, to test out the RunScribe technology, um, please feel free to reach out to either of us. Um, we're at melbournepodiatryclinic.com.au. You can just go through and um, find a time that suits. Um, just mention when you're contacting us, running assessments in the subject, um, and we'll get back to you and we can have um, a little bit of a chat further about that. Um, we'll go to the last question. Um, there we go. All right, so we've got one from Hannah. What, this is for Renee. Um, what's a good, uh, what are some of the shoes that come in a D width? Because we know how important uh, the fit of a shoe is. Um, what are some of the shoes that if someone comes in needs a wider fitting shoe uh, in a women's shoe, what do you, what's one of some of your go-tos? Um, a few of our go-tos would have to be um, the New Balance 880, that we have that in the standard and the D-width, um, but it's nice. I think that, I suppose the most important thing I'll say there is that you can actually get quite a few styles in the D-width across all brands. Um, but what we find is that some D-widths are very different to others. So um, depending on the shape of the toe box as well. So some are a lot more streamlined and sort of um, uh, not as rounded as others um, and also not as deep. So if we're needing a lot of width in through the forefoot, I'd probably say, yeah, the New Balance 880 in the D-width. Um, the Ghost as well, um, that also in the Brooks Ghost comes in a D-width too. And we also have a uh, mark that would probably be the ASICS um, for shoe, which is also D width and it's nice and deep. Um, all three of them very comparable, but they all feel very different around the foot and have a different depth to them. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you everyone for attending. Um, it's been really good to have a bit of a chat about all things running. We all love running and 
uh, want to talk about it as much as we possibly can. So thank you everyone for sparing the time this evening um, to learn a little bit more about how you can keep running. Please feel free if you have any further questions to either message myself or Rachel. Um, and don't forget to head to the running company for all of your footwear. They're great people. They know their running shoes uh, and they'll make sure that you walk out the door with a fantastic pair of running shoes. So thanks everyone and we'll see you soon.